we are live and it is a thursday morning glorious outside not a bad way to start in the day here with andrew murphy andrew thank you for joining us um welcome. how's your week been so far it's been pretty good yeah i've been uh, enjoying enjoying the melbourne weather as much as you can you know <laughs> with the with the current lockdown it's been equal measures of brilliant sunshine and raining skies. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. trying to enjoy both of them. I think the phrase is hashtag so Melbourne. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, for, for those heathens who are watching or listening or even reading who, who don't know you, do you want to do a really quick 30 second intro? Sure. Yeah. So um, I've been in technology my entire life. Uh, yeah, I studied writing code when I was eight years old, um, and, and I've just lived and breathed technology for, for as long as I can remember, pretty much. Um, started my career in the UK, uh, eventually found my way to Australia about five years ago, but pretty much throughout my entire career, I've lived at the intersection between software and soft skills. And that's kind of my happy place. Uh, you know, as, as much as I love being involved in, in software development and technology, I love leadership skills and communication skills and influence skills and all those things that make you a really effective leader in technology, kind of understanding both sides of, of that, um, you know, that triangle of, of soft skills and software. Beautiful. Fantastic. Um, and so we're obviously still in lockdown 365 you know mm. day three three thousand whatever it is yeah um and you know covid sort of introduced these whole bunch of new challenges for all of us um but one i think that's you know not discussed that often is people like yourself leaders moving into into leadership roles inheriting teams which is tough enough to do yeah. regardless even when you're back in the office but brings a whole set of new challenges when you're when you're working remotely and that's kind of the stuff that we're going to unpack in in, the, in this discussion. So I'm expecting some absolute gold-plated <laughs> nuggets of uh, of advice and and tips for people um, who probably find themselves in, in this position. So, in, in in your view, then what 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 do you think are these sort of these real challenges of, of leading remotely? I mean, it's 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 all the challenges that exist in person plus a whole heap more. So, you know, what, what, whatever the challenges are with onboarding yourself onto a new job as a leader or not a leader, plus the challenges of onboarding yourself as a leader, plus the challenges of being remote all together in a big mismatch. It's, it's, yeah. it's honestly can be um, quite overwhelming if, if you don't sit down and build strategies to tackle all of these things. You know, I, mm -hmm. since we started lockdown, um, I, uh, I've actually onboarded myself into, into two jobs. Um, I had a six month contract um, that I onboarded myself into and then um, my, my current employment that I joined 12 months ago. Um, and it, it can be a big challenge if you don't put focus in the right areas. Um, you know, there's, if you think about when you're physically in an office, you just bump into people all the time. You know, we've had this experience of starting a new job to our entire careers and you just see people around the office and you 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 bump into people going for coffees and you know standing around the kitchen and, and that kind of stuff just doesn't happen mm. it can be so easy for you to just be this text on slack as opposed mm. to a human being mm. um, and a lot of these strategies and these these challenges we're going to talk about are all aimed at kind of turning you from those words in slack to a fully rounded human being and the same for the people you're working with. You know, you want them to be fully rounded human beings to you. Yeah. And that's that's all these things are, are focused on pretty much. Yeah. And and in in this world we're in at the moment where there seems to be, you know, what one side of a of, of a debate, if you want to call it that, who who are all about, you know, we should be able to work remotely and work wherever we want to work. And then I and I totally understand that. But I think what we're seeing now after getting off two years of, of lockdown is the other side of the debate saying we're craving human contact. We're mm. craving human interaction. Yeah. The, the the thrill of working from home, you know, after the first few months has well and truly worn off. I want to see yeah. people. I want I want to see my friends again. Um, I'm, so, I'm a bona fide <laughs> introvert. You know, like I, if on the introvert <laughs> scale, if you slid the scale all the way to one side, that's me. Yeah, and I'm craving human connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, when 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 you and I sort of first sort of discuss the idea of, of doing this there was a phrase that you use that, that sort of really resonated with me about 
the way that we interact in person yeah. versus yeah. the way that we interact at the moment on, on video calls like this. And I won't steal your thunder, but I'll let you sort of focus <laughs> on it. Yeah, it was something that I, I started observing. Um, so yeah, I, I mentioned that I, um, I onboarded myself onto a six month uh, contracts job and things didn't go as well as I was expecting. Um, and so I was kind of interrogating what happened and, and, and why things weren't as, as positive as I was, as I was expecting. Because, you know, this world of remote work was new to me as well. And one of the things I realized was we're losing what used to be called the water cooler moments. You know, those those things which are, you're, you're stood around just talking about things. But, mm-hmm. like, it's not just water cooler moments. It's not just going to get coffee. It's things like meetings are scheduled now. And everybody turns up, uh, well, we're, we're in not. Australia. <laughs> we're, we're in Australia, so everybody turns up at two or three minutes past. Um, but, you know, everybody turns up p- pretty much on the, on the moment. Yeah. And then when the meeting ends, because you've got another meeting straight afterwards, everybody just closes their Zoom or their meets. And, and you lose these things at the beginning and ends of meetings that you used to have, where people used to have chats and discussions and, you know, how's your dog doing? How are your, how's your family doing? And, and these things are what I have started calling non-transactional conversations hmm. to contrast them with what we seem to be doing now in the world of work, which is having these very transactional conversations. You know, when you, when you speak to somebody, it's because you want something, because you want to get something from hmm. them, because you want to tell them something or, or give them something. And, and it's a very transactional way of communicating because we've lost these, these moments of non-trans, non-transactionality. Hmm. Um, and, and, part of what we need to do in the world of remote work is, is to bring those non-transactional conversations back because yeah. they're incredibly important. Mm. And they're the, you know, they're, they're the very human moments, aren't they? Yeah. They're the moments where you're, you, know, you go out for, a, for lunch as a team on a Friday where you, you, you go to the nearest coffee shop and you know, someone, someone gets a donut and someone gets a pan of chocolate and then you have the debate on the way back about which is best and where you get the yeah. best pan of chocolates from. Um, I have a figure built by Pano <laughs> Um but but these are the very human moments that mm. that create connection within teams and that trust. make and trust that make the the transactional conversations you have in work they make them so much easier exactly. because you've built this trust. Exactly. Um, and they're really hard things to replicate when you're remote. And I really feel yeah. for people who've onboarded into into a new team. You know, maybe in the last six months haven't even met any of their new team members yet. Definitely. Hashtag might not even do this year the way. We yeah, are. I was I was having a chat with um, another company, and their um, they part of their business model is they embed their their consultants and they embed their employees in, in other companies. Mm. And they told me a story of how they had two employees that were working at the same client that didn't even know that they were working, for, they were consultants for the same company. So they, they were in a meeting with each other, <laughs> talking to each other, and they didn't know they both worked for this external consultancy. Yeah. And, it, and it's just because you, you're just missing all of these things that happen. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. And, and, you know, these are the, the, the lubrication, you know, the smoothness that makes all of those other mm-hmm. things work well. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it can be really hard to, you know, as, as a leader, it can be really hard to bring these things in remotely that don't feel like mandated fun time. Mm. You know, that's, that's the thing we don't mm. want to do. You know, we don't want somebody to go, Oh, not another zoom meeting. You know, yeah. I've had my eight zoom meetings a day and now you want me to, you know, hop on a, a lunchtime get together for another zoom meeting. Yeah. And it's, though it's really hard to strike that balance yeah. between building these things and not overloading people. Yeah. The next person invites me to a trivia thing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Watch, my, watch out for your slack. Yeah, I, I, I totally get it. And and there's this thing that you know we've we in some cases we've sort of transitioned from working from home to living at work, and and yeah. that's a that I mean that's a almost a separate thing to 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 tackle there from you know productivity, mental health, and all those sorts of things. Um, but but it's still this. You know, how do you? How do you rehumanize as much as possible the work experience yeah. for people? And so I'm sure you've got a couple of uh, of ideas. Yeah, it, it, it's it's interesting because this is a topic I talked a lot about um, in the early pandemic. Was this difference between working from home and living at work? Because there's actually a huge amount of differences between those two. Mm. 
Um, and one really important thing is we lose what, what I call transitional activities. Um, so, you know, if you think in, in the before times, um, you know, we used to commute to work and, and that was this really great transitional activity that got us out of home life and into work brain and got us out of work brain and into home life. But, you know, literally my bedroom is four meters in that direction. Hmm. You know, that's not a, it's not a compelling commute. It's not something which, you know, makes me, it gives me the time to switch my brain around and, mm. and to go from home mode to work mode. So, mm. you know, the, the one thing we're definitely missing is these um, transitional moments. And, and one thing I used to advise people to do early in the pandemic is just to walk around the block before they start work. Mm. And, and as soon as, you know, so get up, have your coffee, have your breakfast, leave, walk around the block, come back in and go to the work desk. Mm. And, and that, that transitional moment of going, okay, I'm in work mode now. Mm. And at the end of the day, doing the opposite, leaving, mm. walking around the block, coming back in, never going back mm. to your work desk mm. again. Mm. And just building these, these stages of this, I'm now at work, I'm now at home, even yeah. though you're, you're physically coexistent mm. in the same place. Mm. I think it's incredibly important. Yeah, that, that's a great idea. Um, do you have to go the reverse journey on the way home? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and walk backwards if you can, you know. <laughs> <laughs> with a newspaper um brilliant. <laughs> brilliant that's actually that, that's a great idea um and, and you're right it's that separation uh, i remember yeah. one of my very early early jobs in, in australia um i lived literally about two minutes from the office um mm -hmm. before i was in recruitment and uh, because i lived closely if something happened you know someone would just phone me and say hey can you go to the office and just do do this yeah, thing and they'd find that like, 10 o'clock at night i'm uh, i was a young i was a new kid i was like Jesus, every other night I'm having to go and do something. So there's this sort of, that, that peril, isn't there? So, yeah, nice. So getting up, you know, having those transitional moments, you know, getting into, into work mode, maybe go out, get your coffee yeah. from your favorite coffee shop, walk, walk back, have your, have your work coffee at your desk, then you're ready yeah. to go. Um, yeah. In terms of, you know, the interactions with, with your teams, what, 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 are you, what sort of things are you seeing there that you, you can get some of those non-transactional sort of moments back? Yeah, so, you know, it's kind of playing into the, um, you know, we, we kind of jokingly said it earlier, you know, the, the Australian start to a meeting is two or three minutes past, like, you know, kind of doubling down on that and, and accepting the inevitability of that. You know, I, I don't plan any meeting to start exactly when I send the invite to. I plan for it to start five minutes afterwards. Because, yeah. you know, people are going to run late. People are, are in another meeting that's running late. People, it takes a while for them to get their webcam started. Mm -hmm. And so I definitely, you know, every meeting I plan to start at, at five minutes past. And I try to finish it five minutes before the end mm -hmm. of when I actually mm -hmm. schedule it in. Just to build in some of these non-transactional conversations. Um, another thing that, that I try and do is video for a lot of people, especially people like me who are introverts, uh, it, it, it feels a lot more mentally taxing. Mm. Um, and so I definitely encourage not, not all the time, but for some of those social activities, video off. And, and, and I know that's quite a controversial subject. And I will be the first to say, if you're in a work meeting, if this is an important conversation, if this is something which is a transactional conversation, mm. video should be on. 100% because you're losing so much data. You're losing so much information about the other person if video is off. Yeah. But if you're wanting a way to build rapport, to build trust, then I think it, it, it is important to give people that choice and, mm. and to have some video on, some video yeah. off. Because it, it gives the, the introverts like me a chance to kind of engage in a, in a non-challenging way. Mm. Um, you know, we, we just as in person, you know, if, if we're in person, and, um, you know, I'm wearing a social event, you know, we used to do all hands in the office in the big ball times. Um, and, you know, we used to, we used to have people who would just walk away and go and sit at their desk for a little bit and, and, you know, decompress and, you know, have the social energy kind of built back up because mm. you know, for them being in a group of people is challenging. It's really hard to do that remotely because your face is on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, and so giving people that option to, to kind of virtually step out from being fully engaged, I think is important for, yeah. for work social activities. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that's a great idea. And I also think there's this there's this thing of you know when we're when we're in person, I think we're generally a bit more accepting of you know oh Dave's got to run to the bathroom before we yeah, can have this exactly. break. So he's got he's got to do that. And oh Jim's just picked up a call from you know someone important like a customer. He'll be here in two minutes. But when yeah. we're on video, and we're all clock watching. Yeah. You know, it's easy to to get a little bit. Oh, come on, come on, Dave, yeah. for God's sake, you know. So exactly, I think it's just all of us perhaps just being a bit kinder to each other to a certain degree, and just okay. just a bit more accepting that everyone's everyone's finding this challenging. There's nothing. There's nothing worse than you've had three half hour Zoom meetings one after the other, and you you need a bathroom break, but you people are waiting for you know. It's, exactly. it's just life, you know. And it's especially you know right now in in Melbourne, for example, you know schools are closed, mm. and so you know lots of, of people have kids at home and, and expecting them to be working and and as as um, you know the eight hours a day nine till five mm. that they used to mm. do six months ago and you know be responsive immediately to any request for communication is just completely unreasonable. Mm. Yeah. Like that's yeah. just not going to happen. Yeah. Um, and so you know we need to be a lot more accommodating of that as well. Yeah, and, and I think you know, going back the other way, the the commitments we make to to customers or or, or up the mm. chain to to directors around you know estimates for building things, yeah, just factor all these things in. And... Well, well, we had um, we had a really interesting conversation internally where I work now, where um, you know one of one of our delivery leads on a project was was kind of worried that th- th- this is when the lockdown, the latest lockdown, um, <laughs> had just happened. And, and yeah, <laughs> lockdown thirty five. Yeah, um, and and he was uh, and he was trying to work out how he could say to his team that they've got to work more hours to deliver the same amount of work for the deadline the client had asked for. And we just said, no, just speak to the client. <laughs> you know, just say to the client, like we're, we're in lockdown. You know, the, the the half of our team have their kids at home. There is no way we can output the same amount of work in the same amount of time. Mm. Any client that is worth working with is going to understand that. Yeah. And so your first step has to be say, let the client know that this is mm. what is going on. Let the client know that we're investigating ways of, of dealing with this. And we're trying to find ways to, to make sure that, you know, the, the impact is as, is as small as possible, but there is going to be an impact. There is absolutely no way there cannot be one. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, most clients are completely understanding of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think anyone at the moment who, who has clients, say external clients I'm talking about, probably recognizes that in a normal world, clients almost expect you as a consulting business to, they expect more from you than they perhaps do with their own employees. Mm-hmm. So then expecting more on, on top of that. Despite yeah. Pandemic. Yeah. They, these are really, I, I joke about it, but, because I'm recapping conversations I've had recently, but, <laughs> but 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 as leaders, we've got to be able to manage those expectations, yes. have these human yeah. conversations, and I think when you yeah. frame things the right way, people get it. Like most people get it, um, and are pretty it's, it's, generally pretty accommodating. It's communication skills, mm. you know. I, a big a big drum that I bang consistently, uh, you know, in in leadership is fifty percent of leadership is communication. Mm. It's just learning. An understanding how to express what you want to express mm. in a compelling way, in an understandable way, mm. in an efficient and, and effective way is just it, it is the thing that makes you a better leader. Yeah. Um, and and you know whether that's a, a team lead, a project lead, a discipline lead, mm. a, you know a CEO or, or whatever it is, you know it's, it's, it's communication is just incredibly important. Yeah. And 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 you know I mean we you know we interview umpteen people here. Per day, per week, and you know, for for leadership roles, you know, the things that people say, but often the things they don't say, uh, yeah. uh, are yeah. those little cues that they give us on on how mm-hmm. they think about this this challenge of of leadership. Um, mm-hmm. So, coming back to sort of sort of rewinding slightly, um, you're a leader who's moving into into a new remote role. You're going to be inheriting a, a new team remotely. Um, if you were going to give someone sort of three things to think about. I don't know why we always ask for three. It seems the <laughs> thing. If you were going to give someone sort of three things to consider and start planning mm. and thinking about before they move into that new role, what would they be? Sure. So first thing, um, you know, one of the first things they teach you in leadership school, you know, leadership 101 is having one-to-ones. 
and they teach you about the value of, of what I call one dimensional one to ones. Mm. So this is, you know, the, the person you report into and your direct reports, yeah. like one dimensional up and down. And, and I agree, like that's baseline. That's something that you just have to do. If that isn't being checked off, then, you know, you just need to do it. Most more experienced leaders focus on the on two dimensional one to ones where they're going up and down, um, but they're also going to their peers and they're spending time investing time in building relationships with their peers. Incredibly important when you onboard yourself into a new job, mm. even more so remotely, is this two dimensional building of relationships. But I actually encourage people to think three dimensionally and to to not only build relationships with their their boss and their direct reports and the people underneath them not only to build relationship with their peers so you know if you're head of software dev to also build relationships with head of design and head of product and head of people hmm. but to to actually go into their direct report lines a little bit obviously discussing this with um with your peers yeah. but to actually break those barriers like i have a lot of conversations with my peers direct reports um what the um, the chapter lead for the for product strategy and I have a fortnightly one hour session where we just talk about product strategy and product design and you know the the interface between that and software dev and even though this this person is you know not even in my reporting line in my reporting mm -hmm. vertical not even in my horizontal you know they're they're, they're distinctly separate by doing that I'm building trust with that person. Yeah. And I'm and I'm letting that person understand that I'm not somebody that's going to pure, purely push the agenda of engineering in my company. You know, I'm not somebody that is only advocating for just engineering excellence above everything else. You know, I care about product. I care about product strategy. I care about enough to invest an hour of my time once a fortnight with the person who is heading up this, this drive of the company I work for. And so... You know that three-dimensional one-to-one is how you can can build trust in a strategic way because yeah. that's what a lot of this comes down to especially when you're a new leader joining a team especially when you're doing it remotely building trust is the thing you should be focused on building trust with your boss building trust with your team and your peers but the rest of the organization as well don't forget that Brilliant. um and you know, on, on the so that's that's number one. On the vein of building trust, another thing is to make sure that you build trust with your direct reports. You know, what 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 I worked really really hard on in, in my current job is I wanted to, I knew coming in within the first couple of weeks, I knew coming in that I needed to restructure. I knew that I needed to. Um, change reporting lines. I knew that I needed to move some people out of leadership that were currently in leadership. And, and I had to make big, big changes. But if I'd have come in and done that on week three, I wouldn't have built up the trust with the team hmm. for them to, to believe that the reasons I was doing this was in their best interests. Yeah. Like I needed them to know that the changes I were making were not because I was coming in with you know external ideas of what the best thing was. And, and I wanted to impose what was best for me. I wanted them to know that what I was doing was the best for them. Mm. And so that takes a focus on building trust with my team. Yeah. Um, and also, as, 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 um, as arrogant as what I just said sounded, <laughs> there is also the other side of that, which is I could have been wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I could, yeah. like, fundamentally, I could have been wrong. Yeah. And so by building trust with the team, what that also allows them to do is to go, Andrew, you're wrong. Hmm. And this is why you're wrong. And I can assess that. Yeah. Whereas if I come in and, and don't listen and don't build trust and don't give them the autonomy to tell me they think I'm wrong, then I'm not, I could miss something completely, mm -hmm. um, which is, is, is just, uh, it's just deadly to a new leader yeah. is making a change too soon without all the information. And, uh, and and I think there's a there's a sliding into as a little bit of a of leadership 101 is that you don't have to be right all the time exactly. as a leader your job isn't to be right you know? exactly. um, which I think yeah. a lot of new leaders sort of fall into this thing well mm. now I'm the leader I'm you know technically you might be brilliant and all that sort of stuff and and I have to be right about things yeah that's not your job your job isn't to I be am 
I am not the best software developer in the world. I'll tell you what, like yeah. I, I haven't written production source code in about five years and nobody wants me to, yeah. <laughs> even me. Yeah. Like you do not want me writing production source code. Yeah. But you know, there's, there's, there's no way, you know, like in, in my current place, I head up the, um, the front end team, the back end team, the mobile team, the video games team, the AI and ML team, um, and, and there is no way that I can be the expert in all of those things. No one person can be an expert in all of those things. And so I, I don't try. Like what I focus on is I focus on having strong leaders in those disciplines that I can trust. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's really your job, especially, especially when you're, you know, at the executive level, mm. your, your, your main number one job is to build a team of great leaders underneath you. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, your job is to find and identify them internally if they exist. Mm -hmm. And if they don't exist, to find and identify them externally and bring them in. Yeah. And, and to, to focus on doing that in a way that doesn't, you know, bruise anybody's egos yeah. um, is, is incredibly important. Brilliant. So uh, going back to our three things, first one was the, the three-dimensional relationships. Yeah. Second one was the building the trust. Yeah, and a third. I don't think I gave you a third no, one. You didn't. Yeah, no? that's I didn't why give I was going to do we have one? <laughs> Which we so think the big two. <laughs> well, no, I think I think the other thing, um, you know, really is to have a strong a strong stretch of time where you're focused on learning. This is kind of implicit in what I said about yeah. you know the building trust bit. Is you know part of it's incredibly important that when you join a new team, especially remotely, you focus on learning yeah. in your first month or two. Because go, going back to those non-transactional conversations we talked about earlier, yeah. a, a lot of them, you know, the, a lot of those non-transactional conversations are social and they're about building connections with people. But a lot of them are also the tidbits you hear about particular projects or, yeah. you know, the, the glances that you get of uh, w w one of the great pieces of advice I give people when they're trying to make change in an organization is the people leaders are not always the thought leaders. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, when you're making change in an organization, the people you need to influence are not the people leaders, they're the thought leaders. Sometimes they're the same, most of the time they're not. Yeah. And in software development, it is so easy to find who the thought leaders are. Just go in there and break production and yeah. watch and see who everybody swivels their seats around and looks at for help when you've just broken production. Like those are the thought leaders outright. And so, you know, understanding who those thought leaders are mm -hmm. and understanding, you know, what influence they have in the organization mm -hmm. is incredibly important. And yeah. that's hard to do remotely. Yeah. So give yourself a month or two to, mm -hmm. to just understand what's going on, to focus on learning and not to make any strong commitments um, with it, especially within those first few weeks. Yeah. Um, you know, you can make strong commitments for investigating and learning and discovering and, and building of a strategy, but you shouldn't be making any commitments on what that strategy is. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and I think there's this thing that sometimes we forget is that quite often it's the people closest to the problem source that are the ones you should be, you yeah, should be asking exactly. for the info. So exactly. if it's, you know, if it's, you know, we're having trouble, you know, rolling out this, you know, new feature when a customer spins up an account, whatever it is, um, whoever controls the, the deployment of that out of AWS or wherever they're pushing it from, mm -hmm. that, that are having to go in manually and do it when a year ago they suggested automating by doing this, but nobody yeah. wanted to know, they're yeah. the people closest to the problem. So It's, um, it's so important mm -hmm. to get us, especially in the beginning, as close to, as close to you know, the people doing the work as you mm -hmm. can. Yeah. Like just yeah. dive down deep. You know, when I joined my current job, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't dev code, but I did actually operate as, as the technical lead on a project mm. um, just to kind of understand how do we run projects? How does it work? What are the mm. expectations? What are the clients like? How is, how's our client relationship skills? You mm. know, how are we setting the clients up for success? How are we setting the teams up for success? Mm. And the best way to do that is just to get right down as low as yeah. you possibly can mm. in the beginning, in yeah. the beginning, yeah. and then extri extricate yourself from that. Do not stay down there. <laughs> That's it. Um, there's very rarely in my experience people who start a new job and say to themselves, right, I'm going to do as little as possible um, and going to do what I do do, I'm going to do a crappy job of. You know, I think people, yeah. there's a journey that people get to and it's one of the biggest killers within 
within yeah. teams that I see is indifference. When people are indifferent to what's being produced, yeah. what's being sent live, then you've got a real challenge. And that indifference yeah. usually comes from frustration to not being listened mm-hmm. to and frustration from people thinking that their opinions don't matter. Yeah. yeah. Which comes back uh, to the trust thing that you're talking about. Exactly. And, you know, the, the, the counteraction to that, um, the word that people, you know, as I work with people, they get sick of me using the same words over and over again. But I think it's incredibly important to have a consistent message. And, and one of the words that I use a lot is the word ownership. Yep. Um, you know, I, I want people to feel ownership of what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that disengagement is the opposite end of the spectrum to mm-hmm. ownership. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. I, I want people to not only feel ownership of the, the project they're on, mm-hmm. but I want them to feel ownership of the process and the client. And, you know, the difference between the outputs and the outcomes, mm-hmm. you know, first step is to feel ownership over the output. That is minimum bar. If you yeah. do not feel ownership over the output of what you're doing, yeah. I do not want you in my organization. Yeah. 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 I, you will get gold stars and promotions and pay rises up the Yahoo if you feel outcome based ownership. Yeah. Yeah. Because Absolutely. you know that's that's what I want people to focus on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And 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 if we as leaders and as businesses are creating environments where People feel that they do have that and they be, get listened to. I was going to say be listened to. That wouldn't even be proper English. If they feel like they're getting listened to and that their opinions matter, then then we're creating that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's yeah, it's such an important point. Expecting somebody to get it to, to feel ownership over something, but not empowering them and not putting putting them in an environment where that's even possible. Mm. Like that's our job as leaders is to put yeah. them in an environment yeah. where that's possible. Yeah, absolutely. We could talk about this all day, couldn't we? There's, yeah. a danger, there's a danger. There's a real danger. We might do. Uh, It'll probably yeah. be the, the, the world's most boring lesson for anyone except <laughs> us. Um, so, recapping on our on our on our three things then for for people starting new remote roles with inheriting a team, building your three dimensional relationships. Yeah, really really important for a whole bunch yeah. of reasons. Do it the right way. Number two was. You're putting me on the spot now, Simon. So number two was, um, you know, focus on trust building focus with, with, within your team. Focus yep. on people being able to tell you that they think you're wrong. Yep. Um, you know, that, that's my bar of when I've built trust with somebody. If you can look me in the eyes and tell me, Andrew, I think you're wrong, yep. we've built enough trust up with each other. Um, and then number three was, you know, part of how, we, how you do both of those things is to give yourself time to learn yep. and time to develop. Yeah. So 3D, trust, and learning. There's a, uh, yeah, there's a title there for, for, a, uh, for a video. <laughs> um, thank you so much. This was brilliant. And I think people who are listening to this are, are going to you know, take some stuff away. Um, if you're comfortable, we'll put a, a link to your site in the, in the comments. Yep. If people want to hit Definitely. you up for questions, they can do that. Um, yeah, this has been brilliant. Thank you so much for your time. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday. And will do. we Thanks will speak time. really, really soon. Done. Come on. Oh. We'll cut it there. That was brilliant. I'm just going to kill Zencaster.